Well, first off, I want to welcome each and every one of you. It's always a delight when we get all the families together and get to see everyone here. And, and I always look forward to the Christmas program. We see what all the young people and teens and everyone put together. It's just a real blessing and a real treat. And I hope your hearts are blessed tonight and encouraged and, and have a little bit more of that Christmas cheer because of what the Lord and Savior has done for us. I do want to point out to you that there is a love offering box back there for the teachers. We always take that up every year as kind of a bonus. So we encourage you to give what you can. Um, if you can't, that's fine. We just want you here. We want you to be blessed by this service. But let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the wonderful message of what you did for us, Lord, in sending your Son into this world. And as we have this time together of seeing and and listening and just being ministered to and reminded of the precious truth of all that you've done for us, that this Christmas season might be even more special. May we take that truth, Lord, and use it each day. Help each one of these young people to do their very best for your glory. May you help them be relaxed and calm, Lord, and just do their best and honor you. And may we, Lord, feel that love that you have for us, and may it spread and love one for another. We ask your blessing, Lord, as we trust this evening in your care and look forward to what you have for us. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Good evening. So, uh, I did want to just mention real quick that we are streaming this live on the church's Facebook and YouTube page. Um, so it's not on the school page. If you have friends that you want to share it with, it's on the church's Facebook and YouTube page. So uh, we are going to start off tonight with O Come All Ye Faithful, which is page number 201. Should be up there. Look at that. He's got it down. All right. So it'll be up there. If you could stand, please. singing. You can be seated.
The Cratchit's Christmas Dinner from A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. Such a bustle ensued that you might have thought a goose the rarest of all birds, a feathered phenomenon, to which a black swan was a matter of course. And in truth, it was something very like it in that house. Mrs. Cratchit made the gravy ready beforehand in a little saucepan, hissing hot. Master Peter mashed the potatoes with incredible vigor. Miss Belinda sweetened up the applesauce. Martha dusted the hot plates. Bob took Tiny Tim beside him in a tiny corner at the table. The tea on Cratchit set chairs for everybody, not forgetting themselves, and mounting guard upon their posts. Crammed spoons into their mouths, lest they should shriek for goose before their turn came to be held. At last, the dishes, the dishes were set on and grace was said. It was succeeded by a breathless pause, as Mrs. Cratchit, looking slowly all along the carving knife, prepared to plunge it into the breast. But when she did, and when the long-expected gush of stuffing issued forth, one murmur of delight arose all round the board, and even Tiny Tim, excited by two young Cratchits, beat on the table with the handle of his knife and feebly cried, Hurrah! There never was such a goose. Bob said he didn't believe there ever was such a goose cooked. Its tenderness and flavor, size and cheapness were the themes of universal admiration. Eked out by applesauce and mashed potatoes, it was a sufficient dinner for the whole family. Indeed, as Mrs. Cratchit said with great delight, surveying one small atom of a bone upon the dish, they hadn't ate it all at last, yet every one had had enough and the two youngest Cratchits in particular were steeped in stage and onion to the eyebrows. But now, the plates being changed by Miss Belinda, Mrs. Cratchit left the room alone, too nervous to bear witness, to take the pudding up and bring it in. Suppose it should not be done enough. Suppose it should break in turning out. Suppose somebody should have got over the wall of the backyard and stolen it while they were merry with the goose, a supposition at which the two young Cratchits became livid, all sorts of horrors were supposed. Hello, a great deal of steam. The, that pudding was out of the copper. A smell like a washing day. That was the cloth. A smell like an eating house and a pastry cook's next door to each other, with a laundressness next door to that. That was the pudding. In half a minute, Mrs. Cratchit entered, flushed but smiling proudly, with the pudding like a speckled cannonball, so hard and firm, blazing in half of half a quartern of ignited brandy, and bedight with Christmas holly stuck into the top. Oh, wonderful pudding, Bob Cratchit said, and calmly too, that he regarded it as the greatest success achieved by Mrs. Cratchit since their marriage. Mrs. Cratchit said that now the weight was off her mind, she would confess she had had her doubts about the quantity of flour. Everybody had something to say about it, but nobody said or thought it was at all a small pudding for a large family. It would have been a flat heresy to do so, any Cratchit would have blushed to hint at such a thing. At last, the dinner was done, the cloth was cleared, and the hearth was swept, and the fire was made up. The compound in the jug being tasted and considered perfect, apples and oranges were put upon the table and a shovel full of chestnuts on the fire. Then all the Cratchit family drew around the hearth in what Bob Cratchit called a circle, meaning half a one and at Bob Cratchit's elbow stood the family display of glass, two tumblers and a custard cup without a handle. These held the hot stuff from the jug, however, as well as golden goblets would have done, and Bob served it out with beaming looks while the chestnuts on the fire sputtered and cracked noisily. Then Bob proposed, a Merry Christmas to us all, my dears. God bless us, which all the family re-echoed. God bless us, everyone, said Tiny Tim, the last of all.
All right. So, hopefully you've been enjoying this tonight. Uh, we're going to finish the congregational songs with Hark the Herald Angels Sing, which is page 199. Hopefully it'll be up there. Hey, look at that. It is. All right. If you can stand again. Great singer, you can be seated. I'm Della. I'm Jim. Actually, he's Mr. James Dillingham Young. Yes, dear, I'm Mr. James Dillingham Young. But I'm only Dillingham when my salary is $30 a week. Lately, my salary has been so meager. Only $20 a week. Thus, somehow, Dillingham no longer seems appropriate. Perhaps I should only be Mr. James D. Young. Nonsense, my love. To me, rich or poor, you'll always be my wonderful Jim. What does your weekly salary have to do with that? Everything, Della. My salary determines what I can buy you and all the things I want to give you. No, shower upon you. Again, nonsense, my wonderful Jim. To me, your weekly salary means little. Our being together, everything. Della and I, we've just been recently married, so we're really newlyweds. And this? This is our first apartment, Jim's and mine. Not much of an apartment, Della. No rug. No matter. Old, faded, and tattered curtains. No matter. Very little furniture. How much do we really need? An old sofa that some other family long ago discarded as worthless. But still, very useful for us. Two old, rickety chairs rather desperately in need of upholstering. But still very comfortable. I feel so badly, Della, that I can't give you more. And as I said before, how much more do we really need? What well, you may not feel we need, Della, but what I feel I want to give you. A golden chandelier gleams over a long mahogany table, which is holding a shiny false tea service which on very top of a very dainty Belgian lace tablecloth. Oh, a candle will do what a cha golden chandelier does. And this ch silver place? Oh, that'll just take so much work shining and shining it. But if I had my way, your hands would never do such work. But how? Servants. Servants? Servants. And look. In every room of our huge house, if you need. Uh, not even the king and queen of England can boast of such luxury. 
Ah, my love, if I were only able to pro provide you even half of what my love desires to give you, you'd have more than any king on, or queen on earth ever dared to treasure. But, Jim, your love has already provided me more than any queen on earth could desire. What? This apartment, though little it may be, this apartment is our home, hers and mine. And with our love, yours for me and mine for you, it makes this place truly beautiful. But I want to do so much more for you. Oh, you, your wonderful love, it's more than I could ever want. You almost make me believe that, dear Bella. It's true. Then someday, oh dear, it's almost time for me to leave for work. Not at least for an hour. I mustn't be late. I can't be late. The day, not the day before Christmas. Christmas? Tonight's Christmas Eve? And we haven't even decorated anything. We've been so busy for the past few months. We simply haven't had the time. The truth, Della, we haven't had the money. We've got a few. Let's put them up now. Now? Now. I've got to get to work. Not for an hour. You're right. With the few decorations we've got, our time part will be decorated. With the 15 minutes left over for me to just stand around and look at the decorations. Ah, here it is, Jim. The box with our Christmas decorations. What shall we put where? For the tree. What tree? The tree in our imagination. And this beautiful bow. That's for the tree, too. No, the such beautiful grows made only for one purpose. Adorning your lovely hair. Such beautiful hair, such long, beautiful hair, even, now made even more beautiful. <laughs> oh, I really must be going, Del. My boss will never understand why I was late to work. Sorry, Mr. Crockerty. I tried to get this, to work this morning. I really did. But my beautiful wife, you should see her, Mr. Crockerty. Her long, brown hair flows no cascades down her back while framing her very lovely dancing hazel eyes and her exquisite china face. You see, Mr. Carkady, my wife and I were dancing and singing and decorating our tiny apartment and making a merry Christmas for ourselves. What about our customers, Mr. Young? Mr. Crockerty will bellow. They too want a merry Christmas. Then he'll snap. Couldn't you have looked more closely at that precious fob of yours? Huh, such a beautiful pocket watch and making such a harsh demand upon me. Yes, dear, such a beautiful watch, a very prized possession, and my most wonderful possession, and next to you, what I cherish most in my life. So you've told me, often. This fob belonged to my father and his father before him. A family heirloom indeed. And someday handed them to our son. Someday. Now, now I've got to go to work. Goodbye, Bella, dear. See you this evening. Merry Christmas, Jim. Merry Christmas, Jim, dear. One fifty, one fifty five, fifty six, one seventy, eighty, one eighty five, eighty six, eighty seven. One dollar and eighty seven cents. Only one dollar and eighty seven cents. What could one, what could that buy me? Maybe I've miscounted. One eighty seven, still only one eighty seven. <sighs> what kind of Christmas present can I possibly buy for Jim? With only this, I wanted to buy my Jim the most wonderful gift. But with only this, one dollar and eighty-seven cents. <laughs> I've been saving every penny I possibly could for months. Please, Mr. Vegetable Man, can I have those fresh tomatoes? Surely you'll sell them me for less. Please, Mr. Grocer, only a pint of milk today. I'm saving my pennies. And pennies I've saved, 60 of them. But what can pennies buy? <laughs> Two bruised tomatoes, a pint of milk, a bit of almost spoiled meat. Two several spongy potatoes, but no wonderful Christmas gift for my Jim. <sighs> 187, only 187. It's getting dark outside. <sighs> Soon the shops will be closed, no matter. What possibly could I get for $1.87? Even if the shops remained open all Christmas Eve. Look at those people out there, out on the street, happy people. 
finding gifts for their loved ones, something I long to be doing. Huh. I wonder. Oh yes, I went to work this morning. During the early afternoon, I asked Mr. Crockett if he late, might let me off early. Why should I do that, Mr. Yon? I've got to leave before the shops close. But it's Christmas Eve, Mr. Yon. My... That's exactly why I must leave. Um? I've got to buy the most beautiful gifts for my new bride. You should see her, Mr. Crockett. She's... You should have thought about buying her a gift before Christmas Eve. I did, Mr. Crockett. I've been thinking about buying my doll a gift for the longest time. If you could just see her, Mr. Crockett, her long brown hair flows little cascades down her back while framing her very lovely dancing hazel eyes and her exquisite china face. She's so very beautiful with a personality to match, so gracious and loving, so you see... You have just got to buy her a Christmas present on my time. I'll make up the time, Mr. Crockett, but it just won't be Christmas without buying my doll a beautiful gift. So what are you planning to buy her? That's just it. I don't know. I have so little money. Then you best be going. In an hour, Mr. Crockett? Right now, Mr. Yan. With, with very little money, you will have to search all afternoon to, to find something fitting for such a beautiful and wondrous bride. Oh, thank you, Mr. Crockett. Thank you, thank you. And Merry Christmas to you. Merry Christmas to you, too. And, and to your new bride. Trust you to find us uh, the right gift for her. I've got a mere $1.90, saved a penny at a time over the last several months. Please, Mr. Taylor, make me a less fine suit so I can save several cents. Please, Mr. Barber, not quite a full cut today. I'm saving my pennies to buy my, my bride a Christmas gift. I'll take no lunch today, Mr. Crockerty. I'll gladly work late this afternoon, even into the night, if I can just buy a few more pretties. But even with all of that, I've still only got $1.90. What can I possibly buy for $1.90? They'll be beautiful enough for my new Della. But Mr. Crockett gave me the afternoon off to search all the shops for just the right gift. Madam Sofrany, here are goods of all kinds. Madam Sofrany? Madam Sofrany? Yes? Will you buy my hair? Mm, I do buy hair. Then please, please, Madam Sofrany, buy mine. Well, my hair is quite long and very smooth, even silky. Just the kind of hair rubbing into the finest of wigs. Mm. A wig made from my hair would be the prize by any woman. I'm most certain. Please, Madam Sofrany. Please buy my hair. You sound quite desperate on this Christmas Eve, Miss. Mrs. James Dillingham Young, I'm a new bride, and I want to make my first Christmas gift that I ever buy my gym something truly wonderful. <laughs> but I have no money. And that is why you want to sell your hair to me. Jim loves my long hair so much. Oh, then, then to cut it off? But I love him more. I just couldn't go through Christmas without buying my gym a gift. I will buy your hair for twenty dollars. Twenty dollars? Twenty dollars? What a wondrous Christmas gift twenty dollars will buy. Madam Sofrany, cut off my hair! This way! <laughs> That's it, shiny and bright. They're the most beautiful Christmas gift I could ever buy, Della. What the price? Where will I ever get such money? What a beautiful gift for my Della. But with only $1.90, where will I ever get that much money? Well, I wish Christmas were three months from now. Four o'clock. Soon all the shops will be closed. No matter. What can I buy anyway? I wonder pawn shop. All goods bought and sold. 
good money for good items in good condition. Definitely in good condition, no. Very good condition. Yes? Your sign says you buy all goods. Must be in good condition. I got something in very good condition. Then why pawn it? Why does anybody come into your shop? Then let me see what you want me to buy. It's an heirloom. Been in my family for three generations. Must be worth quite a lot. Hmm. I wouldn't part with it, not for any reason in the world, except one. Which is? My beautiful new bride, sir. You should see her. Her long brown hair flows all the way down. Yes, yes. Every groom thinks his new bride is beautiful. But my Della truly is. You'll buy my pocket watch? Don't often have a call for anything this fine. As I told you, it's worth quite a lot. But it's worth so much more, oh, much, much more. It'll be my Della's joy and happiness when I buy her that gift I saw in the window down the street. Please buy my fob, sir. Twenty dollars. Twenty dollars? Take it or leave it. I'll take it. Th my pocket watch is sold. Thank you, thank you, and Merry Christmas to you. Jim will just love this gift. It's as if, if this gift were specially made for my Jim. He'll look even more distinguished when... Oh, my hair. The long hair Jim loves so much. I do hope he'll take a second look at me. I know he'll say I look like just like a Coney Island chorus girl, but what could I do with only $1.87? Oh, please, please, Pap, and still think I'm pretty. Pretty, please. Oh, I beg you. Della, Della, it's Christmas Eve. of such a wonderful gift for you. Della, what, what happened to your... It'll go out again. Surely you'll see. Seven months and you'll never know. Your beautiful long... It will be long again, Jim. I promise. But... My hair grows so fast. I had my hair cut off and sold it because I couldn't live through Christmas without giving you a gift. I don't know what to say. Hey, Merry Christmas, Jim. You don't know what a beautiful gift I've got for you. But you've cut off your hair. Cut it off and sold it. Wouldn't you like me just as well? I'm still me without my hair, aren't I? It's gone? It's gone. But, Jim, it's Christmas Eve. Maybe the hairs on my head were numbered, but no one could ever count my love for you. Don't make any mistake, Della, about me. I don't think there's anything in the way of a hair product or shampoo that could ever make my girl, me like my girl any less. But if you unwrap this package, you'll realize why you had me going at first. Comb! The comb! What a wonderful gift! The combs I've admired for months. How kind, how good of you, and just the right color to wear in my... It'll grow out so fast, Jim, you'll see. Soon I'll be able to wear these lovely combs. Oh, what a wonderful gift. These combs must have been expensive. Very expensive. You must have saved up for months. A while. Thank you so much, Jim. I love you for that. And here's a gift for you. I do hope you like it. Isn't it a dandy, Jim? I hunted all over town to find it. You'll have to look at the time a hundred times a day now. Go get your watch. I want to see it on. Oh, Della, let's put our Christmas presents in. Keep them a while. They're much too nice to use just at the present. I sold my watch to get the money to buy your combs. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, Della. I love you, Jim. Merry Christmas, Della. Merry Christmas, Jim. Now let's celebrate. It's Christmas Eve, so let's enjoy the most wondrous of seasons. May this... Christmas holiday season me the most joyous time for each and every one of you. And may you open to your heart to all those you love. And give gifts. Even if the gift you give is simply your love. The greatest Christmas gift you can ever give.
this is really the most awkward point of the program tonight because you're going to sit there and watch me get my stand and set it up just right and get all set up to speak and it's really awkward of you being quiet while I'm doing this. Free, feel free to talk a little bit and then I'll let you know when to be quiet. Thank you, Mr. Ross. I'm kind of blind up here. The spotlight's right on. I don't know if you're still out there or if people are still where they're supposed to be. Um, but just a couple of things I'd like to say by way of thank yous. Uh, one is to the Chimes Choir under the direction of Mrs. Tucker. Thank you very much for that tonight. <laughs> And I looked and looked in the program, and I could not find her name anywhere, but uh, it is definitely time for Miss Barrett to take a bow. She really got our young people to do things that I was thought they were incapable of. And uh, so that was really a blessing tonight. Thank you for all your hard work. Um, as uh, administrator of the school, I'm, I'm very proud of, uh, of that, what I've seen thus far tonight. So thank you very much. Well, it looks like the theme of the evening is gift. So I better stay with that, at least for most of my little devotional tonight. And um, as we consider the gift of the Magi. And um, so that's, uh, that's where I'm going to be tonight. And, and in just sharing with you the really the delightful tale of some strange men from a faraway land who came to give Jesus um, gifts that were honoring to him. And so that's what we'll be looking at um, this evening, just for a few moments. Um, it's in Matthew chapter 2. It seems like these wise men pop up out of nowhere. And all of a sudden, there they are in chapter 2, verse 1. And then after verse 12 of Matthew 2, they're gone. And, um, but, and in doing that, and, and I think you probably have uh, addressed these in one way or another in your own life, and that is these unanswered questions we have about the Magi, um, as we see them in Scripture. Um, who are they? Where'd they come from? How many of them were there? I thought I knew when I was a young Christian, three, right? Three gifts, three magi, eh, probably not. Um, what about that star that led them to Bethlehem? How long after the birth of Jesus did they show up in Bethlehem? And how did they know the baby was going to be the king of the Jews? I, I, I haven't figured those out myself. Um, over the centuries, we've even given names to the wise men. I don't know when that started, but it was Caspar, um, Melchior, and Balthazar. And you're like, you might be like I am, where the more and more we think about this story, we rehash it in our minds, we end up with more questions at the end than we had at the beginning. And, uh, but maybe that's what adds to the fascination of this story. And it really is um, a fascinating story that we consider. So as I said, they show up in Matthew chapter 2, um, beginning with verses 1 and 2. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and are come to worship him. So the shepherds were there that night, but not the wise men. They have not shown up yet. Um, they'll come sometimes later. And that's another one of those things that we're trying to figure out. Um, how much later? Some people say it was just days later. I've heard others uh, in commentaries tell me it's probably over a month or so later. 
Some said it's more than a year. We're not really sure. But we do get a hint from verse 2 because it does say that when they did come to see Jesus, he was in a home, not in the manger anymore. So a little bit of time has, uh, has gone through, but not much, I don't think. Um, if you go to the few-day um, theory, then um, you might be right with church history, or dare I say church tradition. All traditions aren't bad. Okay, there are some nice traditions. Could be. Um, that claims that they came 12 days after Jesus' birth. Okay, hence the 12 days of Christmas, which we sing about every once in a while as well. So that would fit if, if, that, if that were the case. We find out they're the Magi from the East. That's all we get. So we, we just got to go from there. Um, what I did find out, though, Magi was kind of a Persian term. You can date it back to the Persian Empire. And uh, that's a little noteworthy um, because they're, they're, that might be the group that David was, I'm sorry, that Daniel was promoted over when he came into the Persian kingdom. It could have been that group, maybe. Um, they were, but they were the philosophers of the day. They were highly educated, trained in medicine, history, religion, prophecy, and, of course, astronomy, as, uh, which is going to be what we talk about them the most. Um, bottom line, they were very influential in Persia. As a matter of fact, that, that group had a nickname. They were the kingmakers because the king would come to them for political advice in certain matters. And so that, that's who we're dealing with when we have the history of this Magi a little bit. Um, it looks like Persia is about 1,000 miles from Israel. So then that really begs the question, you know, why in the world did they go that far? Well, you and I know now, hindsight's 2020. they came to see the baby Jesus and, uh, and honor him. Um, and as we're considering that, verse number two throws us one more baffling detail in, and that's that star in the east. And uh, that's been a hard one for people to explain over the years. Um, one of the things I found out, it really wasn't uncommon way back in ancient history that um, sometimes a heavenly phenomena would um, be associated with the birth of a ruler. So the Magi were aware of that, of that possibility. But as far as us knowing about the star, here's what I've heard. I've heard that um, it was uh, a supernova. Could have been that. Um, someone said Halley's Comet. I don't know if it was flying around during that time or not. Um, another said it was the planets that lined up just right for the one of them to reflect that much light. All of those are rather iffy. I kind of lean toward the fourth one. And of course, being a born-again believer, you probably do too. And, and that is a whole idea that this was a supernatural star that had a pur purpose by God to direct somebody to where his son was. And um, I, I, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Don't confuse me with the facts. Okay, that's what, that's what we think. We move to verse 3 of chapter 2. Um, when Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Um, that idea of being troubled was disturbed. Okay, uh, literally, it means to shake violently. So, yes, Herod was all shook up at that time. Um, at this point in his life, Herod is very old, and he's very sick, and he's very unstable, okay? He, uh, he believes his kingdom is in jeopardy. Um, he believes that the baby Jesus is a threat to his throne. I'm sure he's heard word of the Magi that are coming into his kingdom near Jerusalem. So that probably has him on edge as well. So he is, uh, he is going through these kinds of things. I think the Magi would have come in with a lot of pomp and circumstance, um, with perhaps a military guard, certainly some servants, um, and like I said, when I was first learning about this, I thought three gifts, all right, three guys, um, they probably were closer to 300, to be honest with you, um, making that long trip and, and watching over these, um, 
these wise men, which makes sense. Then I ran across something else, and that was the prophet Micah versus Herod. Because 700 years prior to this, Micah had predicted that Jesus would born, be born in Bethlehem. And Herod did not know that. Um, so what Herod did, he went to the Jewish scribes. He wanted that information from them, and he informs them of that quite a bit. But that's really the only role the scribes played in this. And I thought it was kind of interesting that these Gentile kings or astronomers or whatever they were, they knew, and they did something with it. The Jewish scribes knew, and they did nothing. And uh, quite a bit different between the two as you consider um, their heritage. Well, as we come to verse 7, we find something out that uh, Herod wants an exact time. He wants the moment so that he knows when the, when the child's going to be, be either born or at least when the star appears. That was his idea. Verse 16 lets us know that Herod has been outwitted by these um, wise men. And of course, Herod does not take to that very well. So here's the situation at this point. The Magi has not seen the baby Jesus yet, so they really don't know how old he is. The scribes know where he is, but they don't trust anybody outside of their a Jewish family to share that with. And Herod um, makes a, a rash move, one of the worst and violent in world history, and he orders, of course, um, all the two-year-old boys and under um, to be executed and murdered during this time because hoping that Jesus would be one of them. And, and that, was, that was what he was made of. Um, Matthew chapter 2, verse 8, um, and it mentions Herod sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child, and when ye have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. And, and, and that's what Herod's looking for, exactness. And I think at this point, the Magi didn't have a reason to be suspicious of Herod. They probably weren't impressed with Herod very much when, when they saw him, primarily because of his condition. Um, and, um, and by the way, another, another thing that, that characterizes the Magi, and, and that I just realized today, was how, um, how easy it was for them to get an audience with Herod. So they must have been pretty impressive uh, for that to have occurred. And, um, but this is what's going on in verse number 8. Um, and then in verse 9, um, as the Magi begin their six-mile trek to Bethlehem, the star in the earth, uh, the, the star in the east shows up again and uh, shows them exactly where the home where Jesus was. So here comes the exactness that they were looking for, but it has nothing to do with Herod, and Herod will not be a part of that. So then we have this moment as we get ready to wind this down. And the moment's in Matthew chapter 2, verse 11, as um, the Magi come to the house where Jesus is and, and see. And you know, as I, 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 I read that verse, I reread that verse, uh, I, I looked for it as much as I can, but I couldn't find any disappointment in the Magi um, at, at the surroundings. I'm sure the baby did not look like a king. Certainly that house was no castle. Um, there was no guards, soldier guards there around Jesus protecting him for anything. And uh, just what they would expect from a common birth, a common baby at that time. But um, they knew he was a king. Okay? They saw beyond the superficial. They seemed to be able to sense what this king would do. And, and something special was going on there. I, I don't know how spiritual they were, if they were spiritual at all. I don't know. Um, but they seemed to understand that, that this was a very special moment that, that they were seeing. And of course, the last detail that we throw in there is um, really what we've been referring to all night long. And uh, that is the gifts that they brought to um, honor this baby. And, and you know them well. Gold represented the wealth and power of a king. Frankincense was used in temple worship. Myrrh would symbolize his suffering and death. And um, all of these were things that um, 
really was a great representation. Again, we're looking beyond that. We're seeing the symbolic nature of what they would mean in the life of Christ and how he would fulfill even things given him by Gentile rulers. I believe the hymn writer had it right um, as I share these words with you. Born a king on Bethlehem's plain, gold I bring to crown him again. King forever, ceasing never, over us all to reign. Frankincense to offer have I, incense owes a deity high. Prayer and praising, all men raising, worship him, God on high. Myrrh is mine, its bitter perfume, breathes a life of gathering gloom, sorrowing, sighing, bleeding, dying, sealed in a stone-cold tomb. Glorious now, behold him arise, king and God and sacrifice. Alleluia, alleluia, sound through the earth and skies. Um, so, um, this whole aspect, this whole idea tonight, um, I, I think speaks to us. I, I think one of the things that I see in this as I study this part of scripture is hope. Jesus gives hope to all. Um, I mean, if he can use a star to get the attention of pagan astronomies, he will stop at nothing to bring us to his son as well. And, and, and there's hope in this Christmas season. And we have people who are in need of hope. They need a relationship with Jesus Christ. They need to know that there is one who is greater than all that they're going through. Um, I would love for some family to be able to say about this Christmas, it was my best Christmas, because it's the Christmas where I joined the family of God. That would be a great blessing. And that's what the kind of things that this hope that, that, that this story brings, and of course that our Savior does. And then the other thing that it, that it spoke to me about was responsibility. Um, I, I remember hearing this a long time ago, where um, one of my professors said, if Christ is not Lord of all, He's not Lord at all. And I may be speaking to some Christian in here who has kept one little room in their, in their home uh, or in their body just for what they want to do. They've not turned that over to Christ. Um, I want to encourage you this Christmas season. May it be a Christmas season when you do just that. You give everything to Christ. Um, all of your gifts, all of your talents, um, all of those things which make you up as a, as a person, and you turn that over to Christ and let him do with it as he wishes. It'll be the greatest decision you made in your life out, outside of salvation. And so those were things that I, that I gathered um, from this passage that's been a blessing to me throughout the last couple of days that I was, uh, that I was studying it. Um, let's close with a word of prayer, and then I've got a couple of announcements to make. One is rather lengthy, very complicated, but we'll go through it slowly so it, 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 it works, and uh, then a couple other things. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for what we are able to do with the bodies you've given us by turning them over to you. Father, we've seen that tonight. Uh, we've seen young people who um, really weren't thrilled about being up in front of people and reciting things, and yet, Lord, what you did through them today, they are ministers. Father, we thank you for that. We thank you for the blessing of this evening. We thank you, Lord, for our faculty who have uh, spent time in helping our students do these things. Father, we thank you for your blessing of Miss Barrett. Pray that you'll continue to um, bless her in this, in this way as she has uh, shown us what she can do. Father, we thank you most of all for your son, Jesus. We thank you for the gift of eternal life that we enjoy. May we use those things you've given us to be uh, what you want us to be before a world who needs to see Jesus Christ in us. May we be like John the Baptist. May we um, have you increase so that we might decrease. Father, again, we thank you for the blessing of our school. We thank you, Lord, that every class we have, we can teach your word and teach about you in that. We thank you for our parents. We pray, Lord, that you will continue to protect, bless the families, give wisdom to mom and dad with uh, raising these young people. We thank you that you have, uh, they have shared um, in that with us. 
And now, Lord, we ask your blessing upon the rest of this night. May it be a time of sweet fellowship. May you be honored in all that we do. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Here we go. They typed it in the smallest font possible. Thank you. First, we juniors appreciate all the support from the school for the bake sale. Thank you to all who have participated by baking something or will participate by buying these baked goods. Please listen to these instructions to help the bake sale run quickly and smoothly this year. They're salesmen, aren't they? Um, if you would like to purchase a larger individual item or some unique items, such as a single pie, cupcake, biscotti, puppy chow, or hot cocoa bombs, sounds violent, please exit um, by, the sound, by the sound side of the gym, through the double doors, and head towards the kitchen side of the cafeteria. Do I need to repeat that? Good. If you would like to buy a pre-plated selection of various cookies and treats, please exit by the left of the double doors in the back and head to the playground side of the cafeteria. A checkout station can be found as you exit through the lobby. If you, I agree. If you have any questions, please ask one of the juniors. Feel free to visit both sides of the cafeteria, but you may want to pick the side that is most important to you so we do not sell out of an item you're looking for. And then lastly, we encourage you, uh, you all to enjoy fellowship with other families, either in the gym before coming to the bake sale or in the foyer with your delicious cookies. There will be juniors on around the, the cafeteria to assist you. We appreciate all your help to make our bake sale from 2022 a success. Our next announcement. I figured that we would work this out very well. Pastor would hit you at the beginning. I'd remind you at the end. Okay? And um, I want to encourage you, if God has so blessed you and motivated you to do this, um, we do have a gift basket in the back um, for donations to our teachers for them to, um, to have over Christmas vacation. And I know that's a great blessing to them. So please consider doing that um, if you are um, so blessed with. And lastly, really hate to end this on, on this one, but tomorrow um, we have home basketball games in the gym. And so we, um, we need to, to use the terminology we use in church, tear down, so it's ready for basketball tomorrow night. And if, if you're willing to and, and stacking some chairs and doing that kind of thing, um, that would greatly be appreciated because the more we do tonight, the less we have to do tomorrow during the school day. And so um, keep that in mind. Um, if it comes down to fellowship or stacking chairs, I'd much rather have you stacked it. No, I'd much rather have you have fellowship, okay? Freudian slip, what can I say? Um, but no, we, we're, we're going to take fellowship over uh, the chairs. Okay. Um, well, at this point, I think it's safe for me to dismiss you. Um, I think I've said everything I'm supposed to say. And so um, thank you for coming been a great night. I've enjoyed it immensely, and thank you for your support of our school.